uh, again, thank you everyone for coming. Um, I would like to introduce Alexander Martin, William Stinson, and Emily Trawick. They are going to present to you the uh, energy modeling and design of prototype hydroponic growth system. And you can go with us. Food, the essential energy source for human survival. So important, so vital, that our social structures revolve around it. Currently, we're transporting food from thousands of miles away, and uh, big agriculture is booming, but only in more affluent areas, only at the expense of others. As we know, millions of people out there are starving, CO2 levels are rising, and resources are being depleted. Agriculture is part of a sustainable future, and the hard truth is we only have enough resources, land, water, to um, sustain about 10 billion people on this planet. So innovations are needed for a sustainable future. My name is Will Stinson, this is Alexander Martin and Emily Trawick, and we will be presenting our energy model of a sustainable innovation. This innovation is a hydroponic grow box made out of an old shipping container. Uh, and what hydroponics is, if you don't know, is uh, growing plants without the use of a soil media. So this system is pretty small. It's made out of an old shipping container. And it can be stacked on top of each other and used in small areas. So it's perfect for urban development. But we could also be, see it being used in military operations where food security is necessary to maintain a tactical advantage. We could also see it in disaster relief areas where um, Food, or the ground is typically damaged, and so you need other areas to grow the food. We could also see uh, renewable energy sources being utilized in order to make the system even more closed loop. So that's the purpose of our project. But Emily will share a little bit about our goals. So we had three main goals. Our first goal was to create a working energy model of our system. Our second model was to or our second goal was to validate this model with real-time data, which leads to our third goal, which was to simulate energy use in different climates. We really wanted this model to serve as a tool for future users who are interested in these hydroponic systems so they could estimate their energy use and possible operating costs. Um, Alex is going to talk to you a little bit about hydroponics. All right. So, as well said, hydroponics is the growth of plants in sand, gravel, liquid, with added nutrients in the absence of soil. So, the... There are many techniques for hydroponics, um, but today we'll be focusing on a drip recovery system utilizing a substrate sourced from a local Charlottesville company. Uh, the substrates will be located in these trays where the plants are grown. A substrate is the growth medium of the plants. Uh, there are many variants of them, including pumice, rock wool, rice husk, expanded clay, um, but the type of substrate depends on the plant being grown. So what hydroponics does, hydroponics allows us to bring agriculture systems in the urban environments or difficult uh, growth climates. Um, it also can be used for disaster relief for military applications. And the great thing about hydroponics is it uses um, a recycling system. So the water in the system gets recycled and you're not wasting water, especially beneficial for drop prevalent areas. Um, and another benefit is traditional agriculture applies a lot of fertilizers and pesticides to the system. Um, and when heavy rains come, those get washed into nearby environments, but the enclosed system uh, mitigates this. And another benefit of a hydroponic system is bringing it to urban environments. This helps reduce food miles. That's the distance from where the plant is grown to where it is consumed. So a grow box. A grow box allows farmers to control all the variables of the plant growth. It does this utilizing a computer system. The computer collects its data using sensors throughout the system and then can control systems such as the heating and cooling, the water flow throughout the system. Some systems have the capacity to control nutrients within the system. And it can also control the lights of the system, so that's how much light the plants are getting per day. There are many competitors competing for this market, uh, developing their own versions of the grow box. The competitors include uh, Cropbox, Agronomics, and Freight Farms. You can see an example of the Freight Farms grow box on the bottom. 
So Fidelis Farm is the parent company to Fidelis Greens, who currently own and operate the shipping container in Crozet, Virginia. You can see in the, or in the map below that there's a star placed for the general location of Crozet, and then this is a picture of Fidelis Farm. Fidelis Greens is aiming to create farming solutions that will increase efficiency and productivity through data-driven innovation. Uh, Mr. Randy Caldejan is the advisor for Fidelis Greens. Mr. Andre Ortiz is the farm manager who handles the day-to-day -day operations. Mr. Kyle McCroy is the lead horticulturist and also the designer of the hydroponic grow system. And Mr. Joel Schindeldecker is the um, behind-the-scenes man who does a lot of the business accounts. So the system that's currently on Fidelis, they have a standard shipping container made of stainless steel. It's 40 foot by 8 foot. You can see here that they've painted their shipping container white, and you can also see the HVAC system on the back that they're using is a mini split. Moving to inside the shipping container, there's a series of vertical and horizontal ebb and flow trays with the water stored below. LED lights are attached to the bottom of each shelving unit to help the plants grow. And you can also see um, there are fans that are attached to the shelving units. This was to help circulate air and keep temperature more constant. And the plant that we're growing in this model is microgreens, and they're being uh, marketed to the local Charlottesville area. So Next, Will's going to talk to you a little bit about Quest. Thank you, Adam. Uh, so from the very beginning, we knew we wanted to virtually model our shipping container. But we didn't know which software we were going to use. So we knew that we needed something that could use real-time weather data, something that would give us almost instantaneous feedback was relatively inexpensive and could create a 3D model. Luckily, in one of our ISAC classes, we had been using eQuest and we saw that this would be a perfect fit. So let me run you guys through how eQuest works. Uh, basically, you have inputs uh, that you put into the system and this should be noted, this is one of our professor's houses that we modeled as an example, so I'm gonna use it as an example to introduce the inputs. So one thing is your usage profile. This is pretty much when the building is in operation. eQuest can be used for commercial buildings, but it can also be used in residential areas and for our system as well. You also have your blueprint, where you can uh, pretty much approximate the exact square footage down to give or take about 50 square feet. Then you have your load profile, which is the amount of energy that different systems are using uh, within your building, and then you have the R-value data, and that's pretty much the different components making up your building shell and their insulation values of each. So once you insert all this data in, into eQuest, a 3D model is created, and then an energy analysis report <coughs> is uh, spit out on the other end. And as you can see, uh, there's a large amount of different loads that are on uh, the analysis report. <coughs> and just uh, as an example, we have our heating loads up here, which obviously in the winter time are gonna be a lot larger and they almost disappear uh, during the summertime and they're replaced by the cooling loads. Yeah. All right, so once we have our model uh, in eQuest, we can then simulate its performance in different climates. Um, whether it be locations of military bases, uh, disaster relief, or extreme climates. So the main materials of this project, uh, the main one being the Fidelis Screens Grow Box. Then we used sensors to collect data to make our eQuest system more accurate. Um, eQuest was used to simulate the model um, and its energy loads, its heat loss and gain. And then Excel is used to compile all the data uh, and give us visual representations. So collecting the data, um, physical dimensions of the grow box were measured using measuring tapes. The data was collected using sensors such as heat flux sensors for heat flow to the walls and thermocouples for temperatures. We collected wattages from manufacturer labels on the equipment as well as manufacturer manuals and equipment cycles were recorded based off of equipment logs and in operators' instructions. So our value is defined as the measurement of resistance to heat flow. This assessment was vital to our model because we wanted to accurately simulate our heating and cooling loads. 
So an example of the um, assessment we did is shown here. Um, so on the outside of the wall, there are two temperature sensors. One is placed directly on the surface to measure surface temperature, and the other is um, located approximately 6 to 12 inches away from the wall to measure air temperature. A similar setup is shown on the inside where we also have two temperature sensors. I know it's a little hard to see, but they are there. Um, so one is directly attached to the surface again, and the other is 6 to 12 inches away. There's also an additional component on the indoor. There's a heat flux sensor. It's the red sensor right here that measures heat flow. So we reduced our data in Excel, and an example graph of just two of the components we analyzed is shown here for the wall and the door. We chose data points between 1026 p.m. and 125 a.m., and we did this to minimize the influence from solar and thermal radiation. The equation we used is shown here. It's the summation of the hot temperatures minus the summation of the cold temperatures divided by the summation of the heat flux. And the um, results along with their associated uncertainties for each component, the wall, the door, and the ceiling are shown in this table. So when we were inputting our R value into eQuest, we obviously had to combine three components, the steel box, the spray from insulation, and the drywall. Originally, we believed our R value would be around 14, but our assessment showed it was around 9.5. So this screen here is what pops up in <coughs> eQuest, where we combined all three of our components to have a total R value of 9.5. Now, Will's going to talk about the rest of our inputs. Right. So once the materials are known and the R values are input into eQuest, you can construct the shell. So from a satellite image of our box, this is here on Fidelis Farms, uh, we were able to input it into eQuest, which is the second picture, and a 3D model was able to be created. Other inputs, though, include our power loads. So uh, the three power loads that we used were task lighting, miscellaneous equipment, and our motors. And motors, in this case, was solely just our pump. And we needed all of these to be in watts per square footage. And the reason uh, for that is because that is what eQuest takes it in. Uh, in order to get these in from watts to square footage, just from the labels that we had of each of the equipments, uh, we multiplied it by the amount that there were. So as an example, our lighting was 58 watts. We multiplied it by the eight lights on each row and then by the five rows that we had. Uh, then we multiplied it by its hours of usage. So it's, it was operating 18 hours of the day. And then we divided it by the square footage. It should be noted here that our square footage is a little bit smaller than usual for the indoor of our system. The typical was about 260 square feet, but we adjusted this due to the large amount of equipment that was inside of the box that was affecting the square footage, and it was able to give us a more accurate uh, watt per square footage amount. And uh, once those inputs are made, you can go on to the next most important, which is our HVAC, or heating, ventilation, um, and cooling. And it should be noted that we have our uh, two tons of refrigeration, which is pretty small in eQuest terms because it's used to a commercial building. But since our structure is pretty small, two tons of refrigeration is accurate. Uh, the next most important is our four bullet. Uh, this is where the efficiencies are addressed. So our SEER value, or our seasonal energy efficiency ratio is uh, basically, or the average is from 14 to 25, uh, 25 being the best efficiency, so you can see that ours is a little bit on the low side. And then for the COP value, it's typically around 3, and COP stands for the coefficient of performance, and it's the amount of heat energy that <coughs> is being input to the system uh, per unit of energy used. Uh, and then, so ours is just about average. So. <coughs> That's uh, what we expected to see. And once we were able to input all these into the system, we got this report. Um, as you can see, our task lighting and miscellaneous is almost all of our data. It's about 80%. Uh, these are quite high loads, but uh, they stay pretty standard throughout the entire year. Uh, another thing to note is that our cooling is more than our heating in the winter months. Uh, so that's a problem that we knew we would have to address later on. <coughs> All right, so here we have the utility data provided to us from Fidelis Farms. Uh, the data begins in February of 2017 here at the bottom. 
you can see the usage values are at zero. That's because the system was not online at this time. And this data runs until January of 2018. So this graph compares the utility data in the orange line versus the predicted loads, predicted, or predicted loads in eQuest, that's the blue line. The system comes online at the end of March, beginning of April, and that's actually somewhat similar to our predicted loads. But at Fidelis Farms, uh, between June and July, they actually have a vineyard growth, um, and so they use an irrigation system to water the grapes, and that's actually tied into the same meter, and that's where you can see the spike. But then after the irrigation shut off, the, the usage returns to around our predicted loads. It's actually pretty close with our largest error being 11% and our smallest error being 0%. So for honors credit, I completed an additional efficiency analysis where I looked at the energy use of the uh, model. So um, eQuest offers an energy efficiency measure wizard that allows the user to compare their baseline design with other <coughs> measurement categories. If you take a look at our baseline design, you'll notice that there's still space cooling even in the winter months. This was because the LED lights for the plants to grow generate so much heat that there actually wasn't a need for um, that much heating which prompted me to look at the insulation and HVAC system that we're using. This is the result from my analysis that was generated using eQuest. So the blue line represents the baseline design. The gray line represents the removal of the spray foam insulation. The green line represents an improved HVAC system. And the pink line represents a combination of the removal of the spray foam insulation along with the improved HVAC. And all three of these measures showed a decrease in annual energy consumption. So this image down here is a thermal image just to reinforce the idea of how much heat these lights generate. The temperature scale ranges from 71.3 to 112 degrees Fahrenheit. The white and yellow is the LED lights and then the surroundings, um, the rest is just the surrounding temperature. So when you remove the spray from insulation, obviously there's no added cost, you save a lot of money. Um, because you no longer have to purchase this material. When you replace the HVAC system with a more efficient version, there's a lot of investment that has to go into a new system, so this option is not financially viable with the amount of energy that it saves. However, the combination of combined <coughs> the spray from insulation and the HVAC system may be more financially viable depending on the unit that was purchased. Um, so this is kind of a situation that depends. So my current recommendation is to simply remove the added insulation. It's the easiest option. It saves the most money. When we were applying our model, we wanted to find two different climates from Virginia. So we looked at North Dakota and Florida. We chose North Dakota because it's a colder climate. It has a good wind resource and was also similar to other remote locations. When we looked at Florida, we chose this location because it was warmer, has a robust solar resource. There's also a possible area for disaster relief after a hurricane. So this graph shows the comparison for energy loads between Virginia and Florida. The blue line is Virginia and the orange line is Florida. You'll notice that they follow the same pattern. However, Florida is raised just a little bit. This is because the warmer climate and the lights of the or the heat that the LED lights generate causes an increase in HVAC loads. So the um, annual energy usage was increased by about 2.9% when the box was moved to Florida. We also did a quick uh, feasibility assessment of the possibility for combining PV with our system. So this solar generation curve was created using a software called System Advisor Model. It was developed by the National Renewable Energy Laboratory. The system was assumed to be a fixed roof mount, 30 kilowatt system with a 45 degree tilt and assume 6% system losses and a 1.2 DC to AC inverter ratio. 30 kilowatts will not fit on the roof of the <coughs> system. However, smaller systems could be used in conjunction with battery storage. Now Alex is gonna to talk to you a little bit about our North Dakota simulation. All right, so here we have our system modeled in eQuest. Um, in Virginia, the blue line versus North Dakota, the orange line. Modeling the system in North Dakota actually increased the load slightly, <coughs> not much. That's due to an increase in heating during the winter, but a reduction in cooling during the summer months. So based off of that, if we wanted to take the system off the grid in North Dakota, we'd utilize the wide resource of wind energy. 
Um, to do that, we would use an Aircon 10S 11 kilowatt system. This is the smallest turbine with the capacity to power the system throughout the entire year. Um, but with this, we would need to use it in conjunction with the battery storage for days when the wind is not blowing. So there, of course, is still work that needs to be done on this project. Uh, one of the most important things we think would be to take watt meters and <coughs> determine the exact wattage of each load. This was not possible to do because during our entire project, the system was in operation, so we weren't able to test out the exact uh, loads. Um, another thing that would be important is to bring this to JMU. Uh, we have great renewable energy resources here uh, that you guys heard Mark talk about a little bit. And these could help us test out uh, the different types or how the different types of renewable energies would affect this system and combine it with storage. It could also be used as a great teaching resource, we think, uh, not just in our environmental or energy sectors here in the ISAP program, but across different colleges as well. And of course, uh, these innovations are necessary to keep spurring ideas and create a more sustainable future for all of us. Thank you, and I want to give a couple of special thank yous to Fidelis Farm. Uh, you guys were awesome, uh, especially Randy letting us sneak on to his property every once in a while. He never pulled the shotgun on us like he often. Um, so we were lucky for that. Um, thank you to all our ISAP professors, especially you, Dr. Miles. Your guidance was awesome throughout this. Uh, Dr. Chen, I'm pretty sure you are the wizard of Bequest that they're talking about, so thank you so much for all of that. Uh, Professor Henriksen and Dr. Hanley, thank you for uh, reading through our proposal and our actual document that we submitted to the Honors College. We really appreciate that. Uh, we know you spent a lot of time. And speaking of time, thank you everyone who spent your time this afternoon watching our presentation. We really appreciate it. And now we would like uh, you guys to ask any questions if you have. Thank you. Cost per unit of, say, microgreens produced? Um, mm -hmm. I didn't look into that. Okay. Personally. Yeah, no, we did not okay. uh, do any additional analysis mm -hmm. in that. But for future work, if you want to join. <laughs> <laughs> uh, really, the system was fairly productive. Um, they had crops going out there every week to the local Shawsville mm -hmm. sources. They just basically know what the energy sort of you know, balances, how much went in versus how much went out. Right. Good show. Yes. Is there a reason why uh, microgreens were being grown in this, uh, this system? Well, they had a shorter growth period, so this was a finance or a business um, adventure for these people. So they wanted to find a crop that would be able to rotate fairly quickly and be able to um, get out to market also pretty quickly. I think that was their main motivation. Correct me if I'm wrong. Dr. Uh, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, and also you can do a lot of different iterations on <coughs> microgreens since they grow so fast. You can. Uh, change a couple different variables and see how they react. Yes, sir. First of all, very nice job on your energy analysis. Uh, I was really impressed with what you all put together there to, to see how the systems operate. And I am startled to find that those LEDs are heating that sucker up yes. to the point where even in the winter you have to put the air conditioning on yeah. to cool it down. And so what I wonder is, it, has anybody looked I mean, I know you looked a lot at the, the controlling the heat. Does anybody look to see if maybe they're overpowering that sucker? Like, do those plants really need that much so wattage? So, an um, assessment of the lighting was previously done by another student for the same um, project. Right. I didn't specifically look at his findings. I think he just kind of looked at what was needed for the microgreens, and then they put in the system that they wanted. So it was like a system that they designed. Right. And I... I think that there could be a different designs that would uh, allow them to grow more efficiently. Right. As you can see, most of the competitors were actually like vertically, vertically grown on the wall because a flaw in this design is that you have to have one under each, each uh, row. row. And I think that there's other ways to design it so you don't have to do that. And em Emily, I think, alluded a little bit that they spray foam this thing. They really wanted to 
this is their first crack at it. This is version 1.0, right. and they wanted to make the environment inside very controllable. Right. But they had, they didn't optimize. They didn't do any the modeling or measurements itself. in advance. They just went forward and prepped it so that they could control it without much thought about what, what the energy right. uh, considerations might be. I might point out also, and this is outside of the scope of their project, but <coughs> uh, we'll talk a little bit about other companies that have done this. And one of the drivers for this particular unit here, which was homegrown, was to create an open source design uh, where most, if not all, the components are off the shelf in Randy's intent was to develop a design that would be accessible for anyone to be able to build one of these at a fraction of the cost that they're available commercially. Cool. Did they line it with foil by any chance for the light? No. Uh, the whole, only <laughs> foil that they use is to cover the plants that don't need the light lighting at the time. Uh, it's also a lot of the rows at some points are not even in occu like being occupied by plants. So there's obviously some efficiency. Dr. Chen, do you have a question? Yeah, and uh, do you remember who started this eco-friendly design and how was it they really wanted to be able to control every single variable in the system so they didn't want any outside influence from um, natural light that was coming in they wanted to be able to produce all of the light on their own so they could control exactly how much um, light they got, how long they got it for. What wavelengths? What wavelengths that the plants were um, able to receive, yeah. So, Emily, yeah. Um, you, you sort of just hinted at this, but did you see the spectral analysis of the light that they were using? I, I seem to remember reading something about they, they had they focused on getting the photosynthetically active radiation, and I wonder whether part of that skewed over into the infrared, which would have right. really right. made more heat. And I, I, I don't know the answer because I yeah I, I didn't look at the analysis that was done um, earlier by Matt. So I did any of you look at his? No, uh, yeah. but also it's using white light, so I, I'd almost assume that they're not uh, specifying the wavelength. Yeah, they're, yeah, the light that they used was more of a white light. As you can see in the, the first freight farms, their light was more of a purple hue. Um, so the specific wavelength, I think they were going for it, but I don't know if it was actually utilized. You're talking about this part? Or yeah, in the very beginning. Yeah. For the comparison yeah. to freight farms. That so they, that's a competitor, and they're actually using more of a specific wavelength. Can you go forward? Alex, to where you all were showing the power calculations. Right there. Um, yep. yeah, right there. One. You, I think, Will, you said something <coughs> to the effect that that 154 square feet was an adjusted value. That's not the actual square footage of right, the Right, the internal square footage is 256 square feet. And why did you derate that in that uh, To, one, get a more accurate load amount or quantity and then also we um, all the material in there is taking up a lot of space that like it didn't seem right to be using the whole square footage. Is that a calculated value or is that a... Uh, so with once we had matched our model we kind of went in and um, did some calculated calculations to determine what the square footage should be. But you made assumptions about the effective square footage of the space based on how much Volume the equipment was occupying. Right. Okay. <coughs> Doctor Two. Yeah. Um, the basically you're talking about heat gain being oh, being a problem right. with the units so you have to use air, air conditioning. I'm um, wondering how much heat gain actually comes from solar outside solar on the metal. I know you're painted white, which will reflect a lot of it, but how much is actually able to get through the system? And if you had uh, some kind of shade, like even solar panels that were suspended mm -hmm. above the top of the box, right. would that reduce the heat gain from solar that would drop your air conditioning gain? Mm -hmm. uh, I'm sure that would definitely have an impact on it. 
but we didn't do any calculations. To so you didn't really measure any kind of heat gain from the solar? <coughs> Not but from solar radiation, no. But so when we did e our... EQuest naturally um, yes. has that. Of course, factor said it. it. The model has that in the system because we're using weather and exact locations, and you even specify the exact orientation, so it knows how much of the body is getting hit by the solar radiation. So would EQuest also allow you to, uh, I guess, experiment with different shape? Yes. Okay. So yes. there would be a possibility to do some analysis on what sure the ideal size would be if we were shooting for minimum energy use per minute. Exactly. Yeah. There it was. Oh, go ahead.